please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Julie Segre. Hi, good morning, and thank you to all of you who have joined here in the auditorium and also online now and in the future. This is very much a developing field, um, but I think we're also at a moment in which many of the methods that we use for um, interrogating the microbiome are finally hardening so that I can give you a, a talk that um, I think if you were to sort of use these approaches, your, your paper would still, um, you know, be a, uh, current uh, when you tried to submit the data in a year or two. So, uh, because this really has been in the last five to ten years something that has evolved with the sequencing technology. When I first started looking at microbial communities, I used Sanger sequencing um, to look at the 16S. Then we bought the 454 Roche instrument to use that. That instrument has is, is been discontinued. Uh, so we're all now really very much sort of in sync uh, using the Illumina MySeq and the HiSeq, uh, which means that there's a, a more ability to do cross-study comparisons. But I wanted to sort of talk through today really what are the standards that our community is using and um, how do we set up these studies. So I have no disclosures. Um, and I'll start really with the introduction. And I, um, I, I'm going to give a very human microbiome focused study because that's really uh, my uh, field of expertise. But I would say that the types of analysis that we use, uh, especially from the sequencing realm, would be generally applicable if you were looking at ocean communities or human communities. We are all um, looking to understand the uh, myriad microbes, the fungi, bacteria, viruses, archaea. And from the human perspective, why we're interested in this is that there's a lot of, you know, there is some variation in the human genome, but if you think about the orders of magnitude here, your body also is covered in these bacteria. So we you know, are estimating trillions of microbes. And their genetic potential is quite um, diverse at the strain level, at the species level, at the genus level. And so this is another way in which there is a second genome that is associated with um, all ecosystems. Uh, these microbes are diverse and dynamic. And that is really some of what you will see now as our society grapples with that the microbial communities may go through times where they bottleneck and then what's going to come out the other side, either with humans in terms of antibiotics or oceans in terms of oil spills. Uh, so uh, the, just some general terms that I'll use. The humans, of course, are, the, are host to many of these microbes. The microbiome is the microbial community, the totality of all of that DNA. You'll see many of these things in the press. The microbial cells outnumber the human cells. Some people would say it's sort of an equal number if you're only talking about bacteria and fungi. I, I choose to include viruses in that, so I would say that the microbial cells will then outnumber them. As much work as we've done to understand the function of human gene, genes, uh, the microbial DNA is, is really under, understudied. So if, if we sequence a human genome, we may know the function of 75% of the genes, and we may understand that they can play multiple roles. When, when we annotate bacterial genomes, even things like E. coli, we haven't had that same rigorous testing of sort of what are the multiple functions of this protein. And we have a hard time even trying to predict protein structure, I mean, protein function based on structure. So we're really entering a new period of discovery in which we need to understand some, you know, have some assays where we can then see how does maybe this genetic potential uh, read out in terms of function. So while, uh, you know, we've really focused for the last hundred years on the pathogenic potential of these microbes and thinking about Ebola, thinking about tuberculosis, thinking about Staph aureus, there are also many beneficial microbes. And um, that's part of the reason why we are so interested, is the role of these commensal beneficial microbes who aid in vitamin synthesis, digestion. Really important um, is 
the education and activation of the immune system. This is a way in which perhaps um, the, the microbial communities are re being read out systemically and over the lifespan of a human. Um, one of the major goals also of these beneficial microbes is that, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. So if a pathogen comes out, comes, you know, enters the system and the microbial community isn't stable or isn't present, maybe you've taken antibiotics, um, then you are more able to be colonized by a pathogen. So now I'll just sort of launch into sort of how have we been studying microbial communities. And the original way, of course, which is still done for many reasons also, is just culturing microbes on these, you know, this is blood auger. Um, and it was recognized early on, of course, that the majority of these bacterial species don't grow in culture. And this has been called the great plate count anomaly, where there are, there are microbes that are really hardy and very easy to grow on culture. So I could grow staph epi, a Staphylococcus epidermidis, I could grow it from every body site, but it might not be that common. There is a bottleneck that, um, or a distortion of the microbial community that you read out by culturing it. Um, and also, you know, our systems have been set up to sort of grow these microbes in isolation, whereas we know that many microbes really rely upon the community um, in order to flourish. So the sequencing came about with the idea that maybe we could get a different perspective on what the microbial communities are. And, and really just to bring it full circle, we do a lot of culturing now too, but we usually do it informed by sequencing. We know what we are trying to culture and we pick culturing conditions that will then uh, enable those bacteria or fungi to flourish. So it's quite different. I mean, if I want to capture the, the fungi that live on the skin, I put olive oil on my plates to capture the malassezia. Uh, or I could inhibit the growth of the um, bacteria with certain antimicrobials. So this was really the first experiment that we did where we were even saying, you know, does sequencing give us a different answer? Because I, I'm sorry, I've kind of gone out of cycle and sort of said, well, of course it does. But I, I think from first principles, you have to understand that because we're about to make a big investment in sequencing all these microbes, does it tell us anything different? So this was a first experiment that I sat up with um, Patrick Murray, who was the head of Clinical Micro. Looking, he put the uh, skin swabs on many different culture plates, the blood auger, the chocolate auger. You can see the different morphologies that we recovered. And then we sequenced every isolate we got. We took that same parallel swab we put it straight into lysis buffer and just sequenced what we got. And the results did not astonish Patrick. Um, what you can see from here is that uh, the orange is the staphylococcus. So this is the comparing, the alar crease is the side of the nose, the umbilicus is the belly button. And what you can see here is that if I just do a survey, which is the DNA sequencing, I get a community that has mostly propionobacterium, that dark blue, um, has some cornflower blue, the carinobacterium, and has some staph also, those orange and the other firmicutes in red. When I put it into culture, I lose that diversity that you're seeing up at the top, um, in including that like little green proteobacterium. And what I get is basically propionobacterium and staph, which we know how to culture. The umbilicus or the belly button is even more extreme where you're seeing that actually the, the sequencing would say that there's a lot of carinobacterium there. We can culture those carinobacterium, but they're mostly being overgrown by the staph and the firmicutes. So we're using this now to say that there's a, a similarity between the two communities of what you get from DNA sequencing and what you get from culturing, but that there is um, a, a reproducibility and an, and an accuracy of the representing of, the, of what is the community based on the sequencing. Um, Sorry, I should have put this into the slides. I would say that for all of our experiments moving forward, um, we standardize to the Human Microbiome Project um, uh, mock community, which um, can be ordered uh, from BEI, uh, which is sort of like ATCC. It's a not-for-profit repository. 
Um, and and, and we, we sequence the mock community. We actually do it on every single plate of sequencing that we do to standardize our experiments. Uh, and I, I have shared it with people, but I would also recommend that people just order it if you're starting to do sequencing experiments because it has a known answer. That's something that you're seeing here where I'm giving you two different results and you're saying, but what is the truth? And that's where the mock community, which is a mixture of 20 bacteria that have been put in um, all at the same concentration, is very beneficial because it allows you to standardize across sequencing lanes, if you, stand, if you change protocols, anything that you change, uh, we always standardize back to that same mock community. And we run it with every plate that we do of sequencing so that we know if a plate has failed. And also helps us if we do a study and then we collect more samples maybe you know, two years later and we think, well, have we changed things in the laboratory in those two years without even perhaps realizing it? We always go back and compare that exact, you know, that, that exact same sample again. So topics for today's, um, well, first of all, there'll be the like random things where I'd go off and realize that I should have put something like BEI in, um, the, the mock community in. But I'm going to first talk about bacterial diversity studies, fungal diversity studies, bacterial genomes, metagenomics, and then finish with where is the technology going. Bacterial diversity studies are, um, are typically based on the 16S gene, um, which is part of the, uh, the 16S is a ribosomal RNA. Um, so you, you, I'm sure you're all aware that the ribosome is where proteins are th synthesized. The ribosome is a mixture of ribosomal RNAs and also of proteins. These ribosomal RNAs are in high copy um, in, the, in the genome. Um, and they also have a structure where there are regions of them that are more conserved because they are necessary for structure and also more variable. Um, and this 16S gene has really been used as the signature phylogenetic marker for decades now that allow you to identify bacteria and archaea. And you see it here where this is the, the re, this is on the left is the, the ribosomal RNA gene. Um, and you can see these stems and the loops. And the stems are, of course, uh, more highly conserved because they, they have a, a structure where you're going to have to have a, a double-stranded RNA there. But we use these regions where you can see on the right-hand side is um, the variability. So um, uh, the variability across the gene where each of the variable regions where you might get more information is marked. Um, and then you sync primers in the highly conserved region and you sequence across the more variable regions, uh, which helps you to identify then what are the genus sometimes to the species level. Um, so this is sort of the basic workflow where from a microbiome sample, you can have multiple members of the community. You do one DNA extraction directly from the sample. We don't do culturing um, beforehand. You amplify the 16S gene and you can use that for taxonomic classification. You also can use that for doing population-based analyses where you talk about alpha diversity and beta diversity that basically means how many different species are there in this community, how, uh, how does this community compare with another community, and, uh, and you can compare two different communities. Okay. So I put this in, I thought, you know, really even just in the handouts, you know, just to kind of put this there. Would it, you know, okay, so pretty much I've said people are using 16S. But before that, you know, what are the things that you need to consider when you're setting up a study? So first of all, I think it's really useful to define the question as precisely as possible. Are you, you know, here's one question. I want to compare wild types with knockout mice. It turns out if you come and talk to me, I'll have a lot of questions about that. You know, are these mice litter mates? Because what we've seen is that there can be variation even due to just cages and how they've been breeding, and you'll see one example of that. Um, but I'll ask you, also ask you, what controls do you need? Um, so I think it is important to try to uh, really be as clear as possible about the study design. 
Uh, and that's not the focus of today's um, talk. I'm going to really talk about more of these other questions here. What sequencing platform will you use? What region of the 16S gene will you amplify? How many reads per sample do you need? What are the hidden technical issues? Um, I'll focus here on chimeras. What analysis tool will you use? How will you display your data? How will you compare your results with other published studies? And what information do you really need from these studies to, to yield a testable hypothesis? Um, so I want to just sort of take you through my sort of um, uh, cookbook, you know, how you would follow this recipe. Um, from the very beginning, one of the things that we do struggle with is calculating the bacterial load. Um, and so here, I would say that typically people are using a qPCR approach um, to, to say how many, you know, copies of the bacterial gene. Uh, most people are using still 16S rRNA. Uh, I would say that also there has been some effort um, uh, from Elhan and Bornstein and others to identify genes that are single copy um, uh, to get even a more accurate assessment. I did say that the 16S gene can have multiple copies in a genome that you may have to control for. But I think you all understand that a qPCR could tell you, you know, how many copies of bacterial genomes do I have in this sample. I think the hard part is really, what are you going to normalize your sample to? Maybe with, uh, if most of you do gut studies, maybe you can normalize that to the grams of stool. Uh, and I guess it's just something that you have to consider in that maybe there's more undigested food material. So maybe the grams of stool isn't always the, the, the right measure. Um, you know, um, Jeff Gordon has done this and he's sort of measured it versus, you know, how many calories are being excreted. Um, but, you know, I think that's, for us with the skin, we sort of sometimes think about it where we're trying to just say per square centimeter, how many bacteria do I get? And we're comparing when I swab the skin with when I scrape the skin with when I do a full thickness punch biopsy. Um, and, and, and there the difficulty is that we can normalize to square centimeters, but we do wonder maybe there's variability in the, the user who's identified, who's um, collected the sample. So probably what most of you did come here to talk about is the DNA sequencing. Um, there, the, the, the method that will give you at this point the most information of sequencing the 16S is to use an aluminum iSeq with an amplicon. Um, and so what you're doing um, down here, you're putting in these primers. This is amplifying the V1, V3 region. There are other primers that are very standard that will amplify V4, V6. Um, and you're um, amplifying the 16S gene, putting it on the aluminum iSeq, and um, that's the sequencing platform that uh, we have sort of standardized too. Um, I would say for a small study, what I have seen is that the sequencing is limited because really there is an investment here uh, for these primers. Uh, you know, the way that we do it in a production, well, we're boutique production lab, is that we have these primers, but we then have a, a stutter linked to an Illumina barcode. And the stutter helps us so that, and you'll, you can read more about it in all three of these papers. The stutter means that when you load it onto the Illumina, if you have an amplicon sequencing, what is hard when you go onto an Illumina instrument is that they all will read an A and a C and a G if you're, if you're amplifying uh, a PCR product because uh, they're all going to read the primers that you used to amplify that PCR product. So the first 20 base pairs is all going to look the same, and it's hard for the Illumina instrument to get the register if every cell is, um, is uh, lighting the same, you know, base pair. That's why the stutter means that we, we, we put it in where there's sort of between zero and four base pairs on the different primers, and that gives us uh, where now everything is off register from each other, and then we can actually go in and detect um, much better the amplicons. 
If you don't do that, then people often um, load uh, FIX just so that there is not everything uh, uh, reading A, C, C, A, G, something like that that would be the primer sequence. But to get to this point, um, I, I would say that scale is the issue. So in a small study, the sequencing is limited. Um, and I still think that that's a lot of why at the NIH we are still really trying to um, create a microbiome initiative where there would be, um, you know, some place where you could load 100 samples and he would have 50 samples and she would have 25 and we could really sort of do this together rather than all having to set up um, the different reagents, uh, you know, set up the same platform and have a few samples every once in a while. Uh, because right now we do multiplex 400 samples together in one lane, um, but even we who are a microbiome lab have a hard time finding 400 samples. Um, so, um, there are other means of sequence data acquisition. Uh, some people will talk about oligotyping or phylo chips where you send it and you, um, they, they put it on a microarray. Um, I think the, 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 the analysis of that data can be more straightforward because um, uh, it's more like looking at microarray data. Uh, it probably is more expensive, but you know, these things are always hard to cost out. Um, and I guess the limitation is if your goal is to find a unique or novel species, you can't find that on something that has defined uh, material. Uh, the, other, um, the other really good method is the Illumina High seq uh, And that is what, you know, sort of these big studies that like the Earth microbiome are doing. And they're pretty much analyzing there the V4 region. Um, so it's a shorter read. It will give you less phylogenetic information, but that certainly is what a, little, what a lot of the uh, larger studies that you'll see are, are doing. Okay, so you get these 16S reads back. How do you figure out what they are? Um, and if, you're, if, if, you, if you think the answer is that you would go and blast it, um, you will, um, unfortunately, blast your sequence. It will match tons of things, and probably the majority of what it matches will be things that say, uncultured from a 16S rRNA sequencing study. And that won't help you very much because unfortunately people like me have just littered GenBank <laughs> because we had to, you know, deposit all of our data from all of our studies. And we just annotated as an uncultured 16S. Um, so that really doesn't help you very much. I'm going to talk about the tools that we use. Um, uh, Mother, Chime, and uh, Clover, I'm going to really focus on Mother and Chime because they're kind of the workhorses. And built into all of these are a lot of um, tools that I'll try to unpack some of them, but I have to say, you know, in the olden days, underlying Mother is Sans, Doter. Um, you won't see that anymore. They were all kind of built as separate tools, but they've all kind of been brought together where it's sort of one-stop shopping now, either at Mother or Chime. And it's also been a place where now the community then adds additional resources. So like at one point my lab did a fungal study and we built this fungal database. Well, what we did was then we loaded it into Mother so it's, and into Chime. So it's kind of gotten to be a place where we really bring together tools. So the 16S sequences. Um, um, we use pretty much a reference dependent database. So if you want to classify a sequence, uh, you, you'll, within Mother, within Chime, you can go in and, and use, we all have sort of standardized to the ribosomal database project, um, which is very similar to Silva, very similar to green genes. Um, and it will give you an assignment for a, a bacteria where it's a curated reference data set. So it's, it, it actually has sort of brought into play uh, what are the high confidence differences between two different genera um, and between two different uh, phylum and, uh, well, not phylum, but the, within two different families, orders. So it'll give you that kind of resolution. Um, and you can feed into these databases 
any of the different regions of the 16S gene. There are some differences, like if you want to get beyond the genus level, um, then there are some regions that are better for getting to the species level. So like for Staphylococcus, you would want to use the V13 region, but for Lactobacillus, you'd want to use the V45. So it is important to think about what is really the um, genus that you care most about. Um, or what is the tissue that you care most about? And you may want to tailor your sequencing to that. Um, I also should say that each of these primer sets has their own bias, and that has been documented. That's where, the, again, the mock community comes in really useful, um, because you definitely want to uh, test out your, your primers, your sequencing on the mock community, because if there are signature taxa for your um, body site, you want to make sure that you're actually recovering them. Uh, so if from this, you know, it will return sort of a, a something that you can make into a bar chart that basically says what are all the sequences and the genuses. Uh, if you get a sequence that has no reference, you, you may think that you have identified a novel um, bacteria, but there are other explanations. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, uh, you know, not even to say more about it, but just I wanted to at least give you the basic facts. This is the RDP database. Um, you know, as I said, it's based it's based on aligned, curated, annotated 16S genes, uh, where a lot of sort of work has gone into classifying. Um, and I'm just sort of giving the other, you know, th the real specifics to it because. Um, there are, there were choices that had to be made. I mean, for example, I, I don't, you know, for example, we use, for RDP, they use Berge's taxonomy. There are sometimes bacteria that change from one name to another, and, um, you know, this can be frustrating to people, um, but, you know, we continue to discover more microbes and, and more distinctions and, and there is a community that determines when something gets reclassified. Um, from the RDP classifier, you can also um, uh, generate things like probe match and seek match. Uh, this is the Silva database. Uh, they're really quite, you know, quite similar. I, I don't think at this point you'd get a different answer from using Silva than using the RDP, but I wanted to at least, you know, make you all aware of this. And there are some things that you can do in these tools. Uh, pretty much they'll all do more or less the same things, but it may be that one of them visually appeals to you more than the other. That's a, a constant challenge I'm sure everyone has, you know, talked about in this lecture series. Genomic information is so rich um, that a lot of times it's the, it's the display of the information that really um, is, is important in terms of understanding the depth of it. So it may be that because of what you're trying to pull out and, and identify, the visualization tools that are built into these programs um, will appeal to you more than the other. Okay, if you get a novel sequence, you may think that, you know, you have something truly novel. I would say that probably the first thing you should think about is, do I have a chimeric sequence? Um, and what happens here, you think, how could I have a chimera? These things are just 300 base pairs long. You know, well, uh, that's another thing that the HMP, the Human Microbiome Project, really took a close look at. And I have to say, I think everyone who served on that committee was shocked at how many chimeras we had. So let me tell you about the test we did. Um, how do chimeras occur? Well, it's incomplete extension of a PCR. So basically what happens is you're, you, you know, uh, you, you start amplifying on one strand and then that, you know, cycle of PCR ends. And the next round of PCR, when it starts, in fact, you've ended in the middle of a very conserved region, and now you can amplify anything. So your query sequence would end up being something that had started as a green and then ends up as a blue. And when you go into the database, it can't assign that. And so it'll say this is a novel species. Well, um, you know, how often does that happen? Again, this is the use of the mock community, where um, what we were doing here uh, were two things. 
So first you will see here with the mock community, we were trying all these different primer sequences. And you can see these are the 20 different bacteria that we had in the community. And um, uh, you can see that some of them ended up being overrepresented by certain primers. Some of them end up being underrepresented by primer sequences. Um, and each set of primers has their own bias. Not great. Um, at least it's been documented. But then along with that, every set also has this percent of observed chimeras. So remember, we put 20 bacteria in, and then how many you know, species do we get out again? Well, it turns out that depending on like, how, you know, how you cluster and what are your criteria for pulling out um, chimeras, you could end up in this, you know, you end up at least having 40, you know, 40 um, uh, species in here, but you could end up thinking that you had 350. So um, now built into, um, you know, built into things like mother and chime um, are these things, chimera slayer, that will um, identify these kinds of sequences and remove them from your um, run. And, you know, you, you may say, but what about if this really is a novel bacteria and this really is what I want? You can certainly go back and look through those sequences. They're not removed from your data set. But, you know, you'd, you, you'd need to use that data with caution. So with this kind of sequencing data, uh, I just want to sort of show you some of the results and how we can use this data. This is the data from the uh, NIH Common Fund Human Microbiome Project, where 250 healthy subjects were um, surveyed at five major body sites. And in some of those sites, like in the oral cavity, there were multiple samples taken. And um, we then asked, what are the bacterial communities uh, using 16S amplification? And you can see that the major determination here is what is the body site? So you'll see in the, in the gut or in the stool, there's a lot of these bacteriodetes and there's a lot of these firmicutes, the yellows and the browns. Whereas in, and these are, this is actually the average of the data. I'll, I'll show it again in a minute. You know, whereas in the nares, you're seeing a lot more of these blues, the actinobacteria, um, and the vagina is gonna have the lactobacillus, that red. So the, the major finding here was that the body site is more determinant than the individual. Um, and in fact, it goes even to, to the body site. So that, you know, the bend of my right elbow is most similar to the bend of my left elbow. But after that, the bend of my elbow is most similar to Andy's more than it would even be to inside my nose um, because this is a moist epithelium and this is a, a, a sort of a drier crease. Uh, so, uh, again, this is showing more of the individuality. So you're seeing uh, the same features as I was saying. The lactobacillus is really dominating in the vagina. Uh, the gut is, again, these uh, uh, bacteriodites and firmicutes. Uh, the, the mouth is going to have this high representation of streptococcus. And you can see that this is, again, showing just that the determination of the body site um, and so you can use this as a way of sort of guiding what are the bacterial communities that you would expect to find. And w when you set up a study, if you can uh, recruit a small number of healthy volunteers, uh, then you could sequence those and assess whether you got data that was similar to the larger human microbiome project, and that would allow you to sort of leverage the larger data set. Uh, just to show one example from our own work of sort of how you think about these changes in bacterial communities, uh, this is a study that we did where we looked at the skin microbial communities as children transition through puberty. And I think you can see here, this actually for me, um, I'm just putting up because I think it's a fairly obvious um, explanation or a fairly obvious study. Uh, the kids here on the left are all prepubescent. The kids here on the right are all post-pubescent. And what you can see is that these kids, before they go through puberty, have a lot more of the reds, um, uh, uh, which end up being um, 
you know, all of these proteobacteria. They also have a lot more of these um, streptococcus, um, which, you know, also makes sense if you think kids get these um, impetigo, a strep infection, um, which adults don't get. And we always thought, you know, it's because they're icky kids or something, but maybe it's really because there is more strep that naturally colonizes their skin. Uh, the changes here that we're seeing is that post-pubescent, there's more of these crinobacterium and these propionobacterium, the greens. Um, and, and that also would make sense in that these are um, bacteria that require lipids um, for their growth. And when you tr transition through puberty, your skin becomes oilier. So it would make sense that these bacteria could become more pr prominent. Uh, so that's an example where, you know, uh, even in a healthy state, you could see very clearly uh, a transition, and we can sort of lay it out. Oh, we can lay it out down here where you're seeing which bacterial um, genera go up and down. Uh, so obviously, in the I, I was saying in the, in the later kids, it's these Carinobacterium and the Propionobacterium. Uh, I guess this also does make the point that if you you have to think about some of these things. Uh, for us, we did this study because we were wondering when we have uh, kids, do we have to age match them? And from this, the answer is clearly yes. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so you've got this 16S data and you could plot it as RDP, um, as you know, what is the bacterial gen genus and species, but you've probably also seen uh, other types of analyses, typically when people are looking at them at the community level. And, and, and there, um, some people will just use them at the genus level based on the 16S. Um, but um, within both mother and chime, there is this um, other way in which um, a lot of the studies end up being done on what we call operational taxonomic units. So let me take a minute to explain that to you. Um, so you could say that, you know, these bacteria all belong to Staphylococcus or Streptococcus, um, where you may say that these are all firmicutes. But really, the sequence data is related to the phylogenetics. And we, we sort of have these definitions that Typically, a species would have to mean that you have to be at least 97% identical um, at the 16S level. So we have the sequence data. So what we do is we really try to then take the sequence data and cluster them based on sequences that have 97% identity. Um, because that kind of gives us, um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, computational mathematical way of talking about sequences that have the similarity without having to go through this sort of loop of identifying what every bacterial genus is. And, and, and some bacteria don't have that proper specification down to the species level. For example, the Carinobacterium, we just haven't sequenced that many of them. So I can't just assign things and say, this is a Carinobacterium aculens, this is a Carinobacterium simulans. I don't have enough sequenced reference genomes. But I can see in the sequences that these are all Carinobacterium, and these sequences are much more similar to each other, and these are much more similar. And so I want to be able to retain that level of resolution, but I don't have the reference genomes always to make an assessment and say to the species level, what is this sequence? So this allows us to really capitalize on the sequencing data um, and uh, say that I have these operational taxonomic units and I can assign them based on 97% identity or 99% identity. Uh, there also are differences here in terms of whether you are a lumper or a splitter. Um, and uh, you can use the furthest neighbor or you can use the nearest neighbor as your joining methods. And by that, I mean that you can have a centroid sequence and you can say anything that is 97% identical to it, I will put it together into the same OTU. That could mean that two sequences are really only 95% identical to each other. That um, 
we actually require that every sequence within an OTU is um, at least 97% identical to every other sequence. So I don't know if that's a, a little bit too much of a nuance, but you can see how these OTUs, I'm just, like think about it in the general way that you can either be a lumper or a splitter and you have to make those kinds of decisions. Okay, so then you have these OTUs, what are you gonna do with them? And I, I think the two most common things that people do is they look at community membership and they look at community structure. So let me just distinguish for you in a toy way what I mean by that. Let's say I have two groups and I'm making you know, two kinds of fruit salad. And my group A, I'm gonna use mostly apples and oranges, but I also um, am gonna put in some bananas, some pears, and some grapes. In the second group, I only have apples and oranges. And so if I think about community membership where I say how many categories of fruit are shared between them, then it's only two of the five. If I think about community structure where I say, if I pick a piece of fruit out of A and I pick a piece of fruit out of B, how, you know, how common is it that I would find the same piece of fruit in you know, A and B? Then they, the communities look much more similar to each other because you know, 94 of the pieces of fruit in group A are the apple and orange and that's 100% of group B. And both of these are you know, accurate comparisons of what is the community. And that's where we have both of these measures. And, um, and so we really do assess that because you could imagine that in terms of when I'm thinking about how a bacterial community transitions, that concept of community membership is gonna be important if rare species end up blooming and causing disease. Whereas if you have C. diff in your you know, gut community and you take antibiotics, you know, you could end up um, having a much greater colonization of C. diff. Whereas if you don't have C. diff in your original um, community and you're not exposed to it, it can't bloom. So in that case, the rare species are important. But if you wanna talk about, you know, what is a community that maybe provides colonization resistance, then it may be more important what are the dominant com community members. So I would say most of the time we calculate both of these and we look for if there's discrepancies. Community membership, I'm giving you here one example and I'm sorry I seem to have forgotten the reference for this. It was from a PNAS paper that was done very early from Jeff Gordon's lab in which they're looking at mice that are um, uh, from a cross where they're, they're typing um, obese mice, OB, OB mice, um, that have the mutation in the, lep the leptin gene. Um, and they're looking to see how they cluster. Um, and what they're finding here, this is community membership. So they're looking to see, you know, do they share microbes? Um, and it's not about the relative abundance, it's just do they share microbes? And here what you'll see is that the code here, these are the pups, M33 means it's the third pup, the first and the second. And what you see here is that the pups will end up looking most like their mother. Um, and, and here again, you're seeing, you know, they, they cluster based on who was the mother of this litter. Um, and in this case, uh, you know, here's mother too. So at the, at, the, at the level of, you know, where are you inheriting your microbes from? In this case, where it's a, you know, an experiment with mice where you know, presumably the father might have even been taken out of the cage. I don't know why they didn't analyze it, but you know, you inherit your microbes from the mother, and then there's sharing amongst the um, siblings. Uh, another study that we were looking at, though, these are litter mates, and what we're looking at here is that what is the commu what is the community structure? So here we're looking more at there are enrichments in certain bacteria that are shared by the genotype of the mice as compared to the wild type, even though they were born to the same mother. Because in, in this example where the mice have a, a defect, uh, there are certain bacteria that are more commonly colonizing uh, because the skin is impaired in those mice. So that would, that's kind of the two different measures and why they might give you different readouts. One of the questions, of course, is, you know, how many reads do you need? And I would give you a ballpark estimate of like a thousand sequences for a first pass analysis. 
uh, you typically will overgenerate. So like in a MySeq run, it's hard to not generate 10,000 reads. Um, but you know, it is still probably important to think about uh, how diverse is the community, um, especially if you're doing ecologic studies. Uh, so I would say, you know, it also depends on how you're clustering them. That's why I sort of talked about the OTUs first. But for some uh, sites, we see very low diversity. So if you look even at the y-axis here, this is like a very low diversity sample where we really think that there's just four species. Whereas, um, you know, for this person's belly button, we really are still um, accumulating new, new sequences. Um, so it, it's just worth checking to see, you know, with a rare faction curve, how diverse is your community. And then as I was saying, there are these um, different ecologic measures, richness, evenness, diversity. They all are telling you something different about the community. Um, and they all are easily calculated within Mother and they're also, uh, or in Chime. And there are very good tutorials within um, both Mother and Chime. Uh, they were both written by um, ecologists who really are trying to translate this for people who may not have the full background. Um, in addition, I, I, I wanted to just highlight these two papers that I think really tried to talk you through what are the factors that you should consider when setting up a microbiome study. Okay, I'm gonna, I mean, for those of you who are looking at the time and wondering how I'm gonna get through all of this, uh, topic one was the major topic because that's what most people are interested in. I'm gonna kind of give a, a flavor of more of the rest of the work. Um, I'm gonna talk for a minute about fungal diversity because um, it, it's very similar to bacteria, but it does require a different sequencing um, method and a different database. So I've talked a lot about the 16S amplification. In fungi, there are ribosomal RNA genes, the 5.8 and the 28 and the 18S. For those of you who ever run eukaryotic RNA gels, you know that those are the bands you're looking for when you're running a northern. Um, and some people do sequence the 18S um, uh, it gets harder, especially if you are looking in human samples to um, deplete and find primers that are specific to, for um, fungi rather than humans. Um, and the primers that have worked um, best for us have been primers that are actually amplifying the ITS1 region, the intervening transcribed sequence that's between the 18S and the 5.8S. This is also the region that is used by most clinical micro labs to identify a fungi. And so the databases for these are also just um, the most well developed. Um, this has some difficulties in that I was talking to you about how the 16S sequence has structure to it and has those more conserved and variable regions uh, because it is a functional RNA. Here you are working with um, a, a non coding RNA uh, and even a not like just a, a, a spacer sequence. So you can, f you, you, you don't have that fixed width alignment to do your um, classifications. You, you can have 20 base pairs coming in and out and obviously it's not affecting the structure. Uh, so really the way that we then align, we don't penalize for these kinds of large insertion deletions. We do um, have custom ITS databases that have been resolved um, you know, at the different phylogenetic levels. So it is similar to how we do the RDP classification um, for this. And we get different results. So in our skin bacterial communities, we're gonna you know, see what is the, the skin and we're gonna say it's mostly carinobacterium. And we're, we talked about you know, how the left elbow was different than the this chest and the forehead. Um, there's totally different communities when you look at the feet, I'm sorry, at the, at the fungi. Uh, so uh, in this paper with our skin, we looked at um, what are the different communities of fungi. And we really are here trying to develop data sets where you can then say maybe are there fungal bacterial interactions. Uh, for the skin, we really found that it was mostly malassezia. Uh, but we could find tremendous fungal diversity on the feet, which probably wouldn't surprise you if you think about the fact that this is where you see uh, many of the fungal infections amongst healthy volunteers. So that would be toenail infections um, and the athlete's foot. 
Uh, but just to say that the, the fungal community is not as uh, robust with their tools, um, but uh, they certainly exist if you want to do those kinds of studies. And you can then see, you know, for us, we looked at what's the fungal diversity versus the bacterial diversity and saw the discrepancies. Okay, now I'm going to move on and talk about bacterial genome sequencing. So again, I've come up with sort of like, you know, what are the things you should ask yourself before you embark on this study? Um, so, because I think for many of the times, you, you, you might be thinking about sequencing a microbial isolate and then wanting to annotate it or use it in your studies. So, um, uh, you know, first just defining what is the study objective. Uh, really for us a lot of, uh, our next question is what, you know, what reference genomes exist? Because if there is a very good high quality reference, then you can often take your reads and scaffold them onto an existing reference. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we're going to talk today about what sequencing platform we use, what depths of sequencing do you need, what assembly tool do you use, uh, how you want to display your data, what are you going to compare to other published studies, and how will this information yield a testable hypothesis. But I, I do put forward those first two questions because I think they can often drive the decisions that you'll make later on. So how to assemble a bacterial genome? Uh, just, you know, a staphylococcal genome is 2.5 megabases. I'm going to talk here about gram negatives, um, uh, which are more like 6 million base pairs. Um, and our, tr our typical way of sequencing these is still on the aluminum MySeq, uh, where we're getting, you know, 30 to 50 fold redundancy. Uh, you can also do these on the HiSeq. Um, uh, it, I'm, I'm trying to kind of give the examples of a MySeq because I think that's probably still more accessible to people as an instrument. So what happens is that you um, uh, take your bacterial DNA, you lyse it. Probably most people right now are going to make a Nextera library, which is where you insert the transposon uh, Illumina barcode right into the DNA. Uh, to, you know, probably previously people had sheared the DNA and made these libraries. But uh, this is really uh, sort of one hour easy DNA prep to get these kinds of reads to feed straight onto a, a, an Illumina instrument. Uh, so you end up with these reads that are 100 or 300 base pairs and, and sometimes they are paired end reads. And what you get is that, you know, one read then leads into another and you can assemble these into context. Um, So I say it like, you know, and then you just assemble them into context. Well, it turns out that this really actually is something that we spend an enormous amount of time trying to um, quality control. You know, how are you going to really assemble these sequences? Um, and um, because there are choices that the assemblers are making about when to break a contig versus when to bring it together. Um, underlying most of the assembly programs are still uh, FRAP, Velvet. Uh, a lot of people are still using the, part, the, 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 the guts of the Solera assembler. Uh, probably right now, most people um, for bacterial genomes are using spades, Mira, Mazurka. And I can tell you, we, you know, we just recently did a reanalysis of this in our lab. And they, they do give you different results. Um, and I don't really know what, you know, what to tell you on that. Um, so we have ways in which uh, we then benchmark these um, assemblers to each other. We often, uh, in our lab, have gold standard genomes uh, uh, in our case, I'll get to this, we're, you know, we generate um, a, uh, a fully assembled genome and we're benchmarking to that. But, it, you know, it, it is difficult because some of these genomes will give you longer contigs, but maybe some of them are less, have less support. Um, 
and I don't really have an answer of like this is the path forward. Um, um, NCBI is working very hard on this too, and Richa Agarwal and Bill Klemke um, are also looking at this issue. And I think it's just going to be something where it depends what you know what kind of data you want and what kind of genome you have. Uh, right now, we are we've we've. Uh, defaulted to spades, which we error correct with pylon. Um, but I th I'll try to highlight where those differences might come into play. I, I just wanted to sort of even explain to you quantitatively like how these assemblers even work and why you might have differences. And it's really in these decisions that, you know, how are they simplifying, you know, they go into these hashing um, uh, methods and, and, and try to build the De Bruyne graphs. And it really is in these kind of simplifications of the linear stretches and in the error removal that different programs make different decisions. And there, you know, we st still so far don't have like uh, a, a true method. So as I was saying, you know, evaluating these assemblies is something that's still within genomics is really something that people are um, really working on. I mean, meetings that I go to, you know, will have like the, you know, the, the, you know, the assemblathon where we, you know, everyone takes these sort of genomes and, you know, people compare. What did yours say? What did mine say? And oftentimes we come back to, that's why it's really important to deposit your, your reads into NCBI. Um, and into the SRA because uh, the assemblies that you deposit can have biases in them. And I often, if I want to compare my study with someone else's study, I will just grab their reads. Um, so we get these contigs back. Many of them are quite large. Um, we do look at coverage. That's one of the things we're looking at. So like plasmids can be at higher coverage. This is genome coverage. Um, and some of the plasmids can be at higher coverage. The ribosomal RNA operons will be at higher coverage. Other plasmids will be at higher coverage. Um, and these are also the kinds of things that you have to know, like these ribosomal operons, because they are, as I was saying, there's five copies of them, you know, in a genome. That's what breaks assemblies. I mean, you're going to break every time you enter a sequence um, in a short read library that enters a ribosomal RNA, uh, those operons are large, and there's no way for a short read technology to know where to come out on the other side. That is where we have turned to PAC bio genomes for creating references because uh, the PAC bio, which is this um, single molecule wave um, sequencing technology, can read these very long reads that are, you know, 10 kb, uh, 17 kb. And so that's long enough that it actually can read through all of these ribosomal operons. And from um, a PAC biogenome, we can actually generate a fully assembled reference genome that will give us the chromosome and all of the plasmids. And then we can scaffold short reads onto that. Those have ended up being very valuable for us. Um, and those are the genomes that when I'm looking for a reference, if there is a PAC bio genome, um, it tends to be more complete, and I will use that as a reference. Um, genome, uh, you know, genome aligners. If you if you want to then find, you know, what are the the changes? This is you know often what people are trying to do, um, and looking for single nucleotide variants or insertions, deletions. Again, options that you can use. For genome annotation, um, we um, do, a, we do um, NCBI offers an assembler PGAP, and also the Joint Genome Institute has a, an assembler. Uh, for some organisms now, I should have included it, I'm sorry, um, platypus from University of Maryland um, is another one that we're using for genome annotation. Um, and so these are typically, you submit your genome sequence and you will, um, they will return to you an annotation, you know, really quite rapidly. I mean, not real time, but rapidly, like days. And, and the reason that you'd want to do that is that uh, a lot of this within a, 
within a bacterial species, and certainly within a bacterial genus, there's going to be um, a, a variable region. So like in a staph epidermidis, every staphylococcus epidermidis has 80% core genes, but there's 20% genes that are in this variable region, which is also called the pangenome. So that would mean that as you sequence more bacterial genomes, you will continue to get more genes that are in that um, species. And so you'd want to annotate um, what are the, the particular genes in this strain that you've sequenced. Um, I, I can say based on experience that it often is true that the differences that are in this pangenome are the least um, annotated. They often do come back as open reading frame function unknown. Um, but you, you know, you, you still have to sort of know uh, what is the basic annotation of this genome. So now I wanted to just talk about some examples where you're saying I want to compare two genomes, uh, find SNPs, find mutations, find deletions, insertions. Um, and I, I distinguished here between SNPs and mutations because those are two different things. Uh, often we're using um, single nucleotide variants when we're talking about a phylogen, wanting to build a phylogenetic tree. Uh, and those are, are markers of or signatures of the evolutionary tree, but they don't necessarily change an amino acid or cause any change in the function. Um, and so if you, you can identify a, an a single nucleotide variant, if you wanted to say that it, has a, that it is a mutation, you of course would need some functional studies to support that. Uh, so just as an example, this is um, a study that we did looking at three different uh, multi-drug resistant Acinetobacter baumannis. And our question was whether uh, these three strains that um, all were seen at the NIH Clinical Center whether these um, evolved uh, uh, from a single origin or whether they had um, all come into the clinical center with an independent origin. So we're looking here, uh, every time that there's a SNP relative to the reference genome, uh, we're going to code it and we can use circos here uh, to make these very nice colorful plots. What you're seeing here are SNPs uh, relative to the reference and uh, we had these three uh, strains A, B, and C, and we're looking to see is there a relationship between A, B, and C. You can find that there are these regions, obviously, that are unique to each of our um, uh, that are unique to each of our uh, three strains, and they're in these clusters. And that's actually why I wanted to say that if if we had just looked at this without having sort of stitched together the contigs. We, we might have called that there were thousands of SNPs different, but in fact what you see is these clustering of the SNPs um, in the red regions, the blue regions, this green region here, and again here, blue, red, green. That's a recombination that can't be counted as 100 different SNPs. That's one event that caused that, and I'll show that to you here, where what we've had is the O antigen biosynthetic locus has really come in and recombined uh, that's right here at this, um, right near the origin. So when we're talking about how to build a phylogenetic tree, we, we want to look at these SNPs that are um, e each clustered independently of each other. And when, when we have hundreds of SNPs clustered together, we have to be able to distinguish that that's a recombination rather than, or, you know, it could be a single genetic event rather than hundreds of independent events. Uh, I'll just talk for a minute about how we did use it, um, SNPs, uh, when we had a clonal outbreak. Um, and here we had um, a, a, a cluster of patients who all had the same carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumonia. When we sequenced all of these isolates, they were um, much more similar to each other, and we did find these clusters of SNPs. These are all across the genome, and these are all independent SNPs. And this clustering of SNPs did help us to identify that there was a closer relationship between patients uh, one, two, three, and five than from this other cluster. And you can even see that we could um, narrow it down when we have these SNPs up here, 12, 13, 18, that there would be a closer relationship because they share these common SNPs that must have evolved um, during the spread of the outbreak. So that we can use to reconstruct transmission. I have to say this is um, 
Uh, this was an example of how this, you know, the genetic information really uh, is, is very clear. I, I would say many of the questions that we get, though, we, you know, if things are 100 SNPs apart, is it clonal, is it not clonal? It's very hard for us still to make that judgment without having more references. And that's often where uh, I want to just be very clear that genomics is powerful, but it doesn't point the direction of the arrow. And there are times when I just simply, all I can say is it's this many SNPs apart. I can't make a judgment of whether that means that, you know, I can tilt one way or the other whether this is more or less likely, um, but we really can't say it, it, it is this um, combination of the epidemiologic information and the genomic information because we certainly have had examples where there are clonal strains circulating in the U.S. We have received two patients that clearly have no epidemiologic link and their isolates will be 10 SNPs apart. Maybe they, three hospitals ago were someplace similar or maybe these are just dominant strains uh, that really have locked their genomes. So I, I, I just want to be clear that we're not saying that there is some minimal information that if two isolates are within 10 SNPs that they're clonal and if they're more than that, they're not. This is really something that the global healthcare system is, str is, is struggling to, to incorporate genomics into it. So I'm going to talk now about metagenomics, um, which I have to say is probably the, the, the topic in which there is the greatest uh, change coming on now. This is basically, we've talked about sort of using these markers and using these. This is basically like you take a sample from someone's stool, someone's skin, something like this. You just feed it straight onto a sequencer and then wow, do you have a bioinformatics challenge. Um, so it's a very complex mixture and it's very complex computationally. So what do we do? I think um, a shotgun metagenomic analysis, you do this when you want to know really who's there and their abundance and you want to know their function and you want to know what genes are present and you want to identify pathways and you want to identify strains and you want to recover genomes and you want to find novel pathogenic organisms, but you get just so much data. Um, that uh, you probably do need an analysis plan before you start getting these sequences because they are overwhelming. So I've been talking about, you know, on the, on the left where you're doing these sort of marker genome studies and now, as I said, we're just going to get fragments of DNA back. So what do you do with them? Well, the reason that you would do this is if you're trying to think about, you know, differences and you may even have, as we were as I sort of talked about where there are these pan genome, open genomes, different strains, different species can have different genes. So you could get something here which is a, a Phil Hugenholtz example where, you know, you'd have the sort of similar bacterial community but within this the open part of the genome or the flexible part of the genome might encode different genes and so you'd end up having what look like two similar bacterial fungal, you know, communities that actually do have very different genes that they're encoding. And that's when you'd need to get to metagenomics. Uh, this is the other reason you want to get to metagenomics, which I, I actually have to say, I find these studies totally cool. So like, you know, they're trying to find out like how does a, you know, a termite, how does it digest wood, right? So that's actually a function we might want to know because we might want to use that to like, you know, sort of for to find new metabolic enzymes. Um, how does the, you know, the rumen of a cow um, degrade this biomass? How do you create energy from biomass? And so, you know, these are metagenomic studies where they're then looking to see what are the, you know, we need to, how else are you going to find it? You don't know what it is that you're looking for. They're looking for new metabolic enzymes. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, you know, so there are two ways that you can do, you get this large data set and, you know, the first thing you, you probably say is, wow, this is a lot more than I was expecting. Um, so I really am trying to break it down here that you can either do read-based methods or you can do assembly-based methods where you can try to assemble your reads and then uh, use these larger contigs to identify 
uh, genomes and clusters and do gene calling and, um, uh, or you can just do read-based mapping. So I'm going to talk about those two strategies. If you're looking for function, um, you can use these, you know, keg, cog, these kinds of tools that um, leverage functional databases. Um, and, you know, this is really as good as it gets. And the only issue here is that they tend to be more focused on sort of metabolic, you know, core functions. And um, they're not going to return as much of the unannotated dark matter of the microbes. Uh, there are some um, pathways that you can use. This is um, Curtis Huttenhauer's Human, um, where he's trying to give you sort of, uh, you feed in your reads and you'll get out pathway coverage, pathway abundance. Um, this is certainly a good place to start. Um, and Curtis keeps all these tools available and they're all, all available through the bio bakery and he does continue to improve them. Um, it's a fairly, you know, solid generic look at your data. This would be an example of the kind of output that you get. On the top, I'm showing you the great differences that we're seeing, and we've we talked about at the beginning of it, where you know the stool has all these bacteria deets and these firmicutes, whereas the um, oral community uh, is going to have more of the Streptococcus and so on. When you look at them in terms of their functional output, they all look much more generic, right? And that's, you know, we know that there are differences in what these communities do, but as I was saying, these are the functions that are most often annotated. We can, you know, every bacteria deed is still going to have to go through cell cycle division. So those functions are going to be better known. So it kind of gives you this sort of blurred view where it, everything looks sort of much more similar than maybe if we incorporated what were the unannotated functions in the, you know, would tell us. But these are certainly, you know, as good as it gets. Uh, some people are trying to call genomes out of metagenomics. I think that this, um, if you have hard to culture organisms, uh, this is uh, one of the things that you can do is you can just shotgun metagenomic sequence um, and then try to bin them. This actually was pretty cool where they're binning them here both on, um, sorry, that should say tetranucleotide, oh, it sort of does, tetranucleotide frequencies. Um, and from a metagenomic sample, they're like pulling apart the reads that into different genomes. Um, if you can culture the organisms, it's much easier to culture them and match the um, isolates to the metagenomic reads. Um, and I realize I'm not giving you a path forward here, but this is kind of the state of, you know, if you set up a metagenomic sequence, you should be prepared to spend uh, at least a year analyzing your data, at least we do. Um, you know, th the sort of idea about how to form these linkage groups um, so, because that could make it more powerful and sort of an intermediate between single reads and um, having full genomes is to sort of try to bin your reads into clusters. And the, the way this has been leveraged um, originally in this paper from Carlson is that if you have multiple samples, you think, well, if these two you know, reads are from the same genome, then I would expect that they would be found at the same frequency in the different samples. So you, you, you form as many contigs as you can, but they are often quite small. And then you cluster those contigs based on their frequency in multiple samples. And that can get you to be able to reconstruct larger metagenomic clusters. And that's kind of where the state of the art is moving. I wanted to still talk about something that um, uh, is another way that we leverage metagenomic data. And for us, that's called strain tracking, where I've been talking about how there are this pan genome. So, you know, my favorites, we talk about Staph epidermidis, how it's 80% core, and then the 20% are often these uh, more diverse mechanisms. So, um, Evan Johnson at, at BU. Um, wrote this program called ClinPathoscope, where 
um, you know, if, if, if reads come from the um, core, then they're going to map to, you know, every genome. You, you have to have a, refer a set of reference strains. You have to already have uh, sequenced genomes for um, phylogenetically diverse strains. There can be SNPs that distinguish these. In the pan genome, you're going to have reads that um, map to some strains but not others. And then uh, with Evans' program, uh, Pathoscope, it, it, it takes both the information from the SNPs and also from the pan genome and will reassign uh, so that now you would assign all of these reads to strain A. Uh, we, you know, that's obviously been done with a lot of simulated data, but also we've done that with our human data where we then are looking at, um, uh, you know, from a single individual, if they could have all of these different strains, we look to see of the, you know, on their body sites, what strains of P. acnes do they have? Um, or, I don't know why these, I have to redo, sorry, these slides are cut off, but they should be full in your handouts. I don't know what I've done wrong to them. Um, uh, but this happens to me every time I present on a PC, and I don't know what it is. So, um, we've used this data um, to sort of um, look and see, uh, this is one healthy volunteer, and they have different strains, um, uh, different individuals have different strains. Um, well, you can see some of it here. <laughs> so here for the P. acnes, you can see that um, individual C will have those uh, brown strains, but individual A is only having these blue and green, uh, and the purples are, you know, between the two. So you can start to use this to then say, you know, what strains are carried by the different individuals, and you may from this see strains that are particularly enriched in a disease state. That's what we're looking for. That's why we're going all the way to the strain level, because it might be that some strains of P. acnes are more associated with the development of acne than the comm commensal beneficial ones. Strain tracking is also able to be done with read assignment to find the core and the accessory genomes. This is if you don't have reference genomes, but you have many more reads. Uh, so this is um, a very similar, uh, you know, it, it's two different ways of leveraging, you know, the kind of data you're going to get out of metagenomics. So why are strains important? I think it's really just to find um, the accessory genes to determine whether prebiotics or probiotics can have a lasting effect. Could you get a new strain in? How stable are these strains? And to under, uh, underlie what's happening with diseases. Um, really as my last topic here, I'm going to talk just about uh, within the context of metagenomics. Some people are now trying to use this where you have a patient who presents with fever of unknown origin, and you want to know in a clinical setting, could you identify what is the pathogen? So one way of doing that is clinpathoscope that I've just um, discussed from Evan Johnson, and this is also SERPI from Charles Chu, which is going through this same kind of analysis where you're taking raw sequences and you're saying, what does this match to? I think both of these are very powerful, and the question is that I, I would just caution you that you will get an answer, um, and, you know, it often is related to just how many times has a sequence been deposited in the database, you know, if, if, um, if it, 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 will, it will make a match for you. This has been used very successfully by Charles, where he was trying to identify a patient who had exactly that, you know recurrent illness and they couldn't identify what it was. They used this um, uh, sequencing to identify this leptospiratiae that um, they could then validate in a clinical test and, and def um, define the best um, treatment for this um, patient. Uh, for all of these studies, you will often have, um, I've talked all about the microbial DNA. I would just caution you that, you know, with the genomic data sharing policy, you also will get human DNA, and you really have to think about, um, you know, if your studies involve the microbial DNA, uh, to be very careful what you're doing with the human DNA, um, and especially, you know, n if your goal is to sequence a microbial community, uh, you will likely recover human DNA, and you shouldn't just deposit it in the database in an open way without, um, uh, uh, you know, filtering it out, and also that you will recover human DNA. So I, I um, 
consent all of my patients or all of our subjects for whole genome, whole exome sequencing, uh, because I do want them to be aware that even if I am trying to sequence their microbial DNA, I will recover human DNA. And I, I just think that's something that patients should be aware of. In the last two seconds, I'll just, you know, close because this is actually a smaller part of my talk than it's ever been before. Where is the se sequencing technology now and where is it going? Um, a lot of the stuff is right now just going on the Illumina MySeq and the HiSeq. I think the PacBio um, has a role for us right now for looking at long reads to get these good reference genomes. And, you know, is there any new tr technology on the horizon before I give this talk again in two years? Uh, the only one that I'm aware of is this MinION, which you can see is a small handheld device. Um, it's a portable small cell. Uh, could be used for fast diagnosis, like think Ebola. Um, um, and um, so that's, you know, that's probably the only new thing on the horizon. And I'll just finish by saying, you know, I sort of talked at the beginning and talk at the end about sequencing is the start. Really, you're trying to generate a testable hypothesis with the sequencing data. Maybe you're trying to identify a novel pathogen, but then you still have to think about how would I test this, you know, and what do I do with that? So with the sequencing, <laughs> what I've really tried to talk about here is coming back to Cox's postulates where you're trying to assess that, you know, there's a, maybe a microbe that causes a disease, but our more nuanced view now where there's a microbe causing a disease, but it may be causing that disease only in the context of a certain microbial community. So you need to understand what is that micro and probably down to the like sequence level, you know, because different strains may or may not be able to do that function. And it may or may not be able to do that in the context of what is the microbial community. So, you know, with that I'll close. We're just, we're really trying to understand what is the role of possible pathogens in the context of a microbial community. So thank you all very much. Thank you.